Hi, my name is Joshua Lingle, and I am the president of I-Squared Ministries, Empowering Missions to Muslims. And God gave me this assignment uh, to put the best professors in the world on video to train up the church to evangelize the Muslim world around us. I spent the last 21 years in ministering to Muslims and training Christians in Muslim evangelism, and it's my pleasure to teach you about Christian apologetics to Islam. And in this class, I hope to encourage your hearts and to challenge your minds. But let's begin with encouraging your hearts. Why should we even care about Muslims? And for some of you listening, the answer is very simple. You come from a Muslim country or your family members are Muslims. However, there's a large group of you who care about Muslims just because God does. And I fall into that category. But for those of you who are not sure how to answer that question, why I care about Muslims, I want to spend the next hour explaining to you why. Muslims are the largest unreached people group in the whole world who have not heard the gospel. Today, there are 1.57 billion Muslims total. And I teach at Biola University for the last 19 semesters, and one of my students shared with me that they visited a town in Yemen and in this one city in Yemen, there were some three million Muslims and not one reported Christians. Not one. The second largest unreached religious population in the world are the Hindus at 900 million. And finally, there are 364 million Buddhists. While these groups remain unreached, the church sends the fewest and the most land trained missionaries to the Muslim world. Less than 1% of the missionaries are sent to minister amongst the Muslims. And there's only one missionary for every 420,000 Muslims. 98% of the Christian workers minister in already Christianized areas. And every 24 hours, 37,000 Muslims die without the gospel of Jesus Christ. By contrast, Muslims seem to be doing much more in preparing their young people to evangelize us. Uh, one source says that there are some uh, 200,000 students from the ages of 8 to 30 years old just from one country of Pakistan that study and graduate from ultra-conservative Islamic religious schools every year. In many nations, we have Bible schools, and in Muslim countries, they have uh, Islamic schools or madrasas. They study the Quran, their holy book, and the Islamic traditions for eight years, eight hours a day. And these students are sufficiently trained to easily challenge most of us in our faith. Christians are woefully unprepared to understand the challenge of Islam around them. Could you imagine reading the Bible for eight hours a day? Do you do that? Many of the, these uh, Muslim children have the entire Quran memorized by the time they're ages of nine years old to 11 years old. And the Quran is the size of our New Testament. So it's... Uh, it's a, it's a fairly large book. But how many here actually have the entire New Testament memorized? These children grow up to become missionaries for Islam, and they travel to countries all over the world where they want you and I to become Muslims. And it's the job of the Christians to reach out to them. But it appears that they're doing a much better job of reaching out to us. It's no surprise that Muslims are the largest unreached people group in the world who have not heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. But these, these numbers are really shocking to me. And this isn't how it's supposed to be. Jesus Christ mandates the Great Commission to all believers, he says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey all that I've commanded you to do. Now, some of us here may not actually realize or understand how this command actually relates to us. You may be asking yourself, what's my specific calling? What's my role in the Great Commission? And since you're listening to this class, I'm assuming that you're already convicted or convinced to do missions to some degree. But we know that the Great Commission is there, and if it's written in God's word, we know that it's important to him. If we were to pie out God's heart, and we were to look at God's heart, who are the people that God is actually sending us to? 
So Muslims, Hindus, and Buddhists all need to be reached, but Muslims are by far the largest group. Most Muslims live within the geographical area called the 1040 window, which most of you, I'm assuming, are, uh, are familiar with. It includes North Africa, the Middle East, and Asia. The four largest Muslim countries in the world include Indonesia, with some 202 million Muslims, Pakistan, secondly, with 174 million Muslims, India, with 161 million Muslims, and Bangladesh, with 145 million Muslims. Now note that these nations are not even in the Middle East. Islam is growing in a substantial rate in Southeast Asia, and that's where the largest numbers of Muslims in the world are. In 1908, a missionary to Muslims by the name of Dr. Samuel Zwamer estimated that there were some 230 million Muslims worldwide. Today, less than 100 years later, we're looking at six times that number, or seven times that number, at 1.57 billion Muslims. Islam's not going away, brothers and sisters. It's only growing. Islam is no longer only in the Middle East. It's in Asia, it's in Africa, it's in Europe, in Latin America, in the United States. But if we do not reach the Muslims, they'll continue to enter a Christless eternity. The reality is that in the next 24 hours, 37,000 Muslims will die without Christ. Is the largest unreached people group in the whole world on God's heart? I think so. The question is, is it on your heart? Do you care about those things which God cares most about? Is the completion of the Great Commission amongst the least reached people in the world on the top of your list as your life's purpose and goals? When we read the Bible, we see that from the beginning, God had put in motion a plan to reach the nations in the book of Genesis. He made a promise to a childless man, Abraham. He promised that Abraham's offspring would be as numerous as the stars of the sky and the sands of the seashore. And miraculously, he had a child in his old age, Isaac, who was the father of the nation of Israel. From Israel came the Messiah, Jesus, and who not only came to save a nation, but all mankind. Everyone who believes in Jesus as their Lord and Savior becomes a child of God. Today, Abraham's spiritual children are as numerous as the stars in the sky, and there's some two billion Christians today globally. God kept his promise, and from the beginning, God's plan to set a people apart for himself, and that is why you and I are here worshiping him today. You see, the whole foundation of God's story is missions. His story in the Bible has been one of reaching people's souls so that they would worship him. Jesus left us the task of making worshipers of the nations through the Great Commission. So the Abrahamic promise continues. But most importantly for us today is this question. How do we answer or understand what it means to make the Great Commission an integral part of our short lives here on earth. And we must learn from four men, I believe, Jesus, Paul, Raymond Lull, and Henry Martin. Jesus was the most radical missionary the world has ever seen. I'm in awe that God himself was the first Great Commission missionary. Jesus left the glories of heaven to come to earth, and that's a greater divide than any nation state or borders across the world. He clothed himself in the stench of flesh just to walk amongst us and to be with us. He was born into poverty and was found himself a young child in a manger. Isaiah writes in prophetic anticipation of Christ's coming. He was despised by people. He was de de rejected. He, one who experienced pain was acquainted with illness. People hid their faces from him. And uh, he was despised and was considered him insignificant. 
but he lifted up our illnesses and he carried our pain. I'm convinced that Jesus came to show us what it really means to be human. We have the perfect example of humanity because we have God in the human flesh. Jesus was not only a missionary, but he was also a radical missionary recruiter. He calls you to be a disciple as he did with Nathaniel and Philip in John 1.43, where he says, come follow me. Now, an unlikely modern-day example of Jesus' sacrifice is the now-deceased Osama bin Laden. He is one of the most popular Muslim terrorist leaders in the world. But this man left the glories of, of a $330 million estate to live in a cave to recruit radicals for his mission of Islamic Jihad. Jesus went to the rich young ruler, and the man asked him what he needed to do to inherit eternal life. And Jesus said, follow the commandments. And the man said, these things I've done perfectly since birth. And Jesus said, great, but there's still one thing you still lack. There's still one thing you still lack. There's still one thing you still lack. Is there something that you still lack? And he said to this man, sell everything you have, give it to the poor, and come follow me. He offered this man an invitation to missions, but the man walked away sad because he was unworthy of the kingdom. And what was Jesus' reply to Peter regarding this rich man's action? He turns to him and says, it's difficult for the rich to inherit the kingdom of God. It's difficult. So if it was true in the, for the rich young ruler in the first century, it's true for us in the 21st century. Jesus was a radical recruiter. He recruited radical followers for himself. I don't endorse Osama bin Laden's quest, but I do respect his passion and his zeal. But would you do that? Question for you to consider today. How many of you would leave everything you have sell it, give it to the poor if Jesus asked you to do it today. To leave everything that we know for the calling of Christ's mission. How do you know if you're in the same category of the rich young ruler today? Wouldn't you want to know that? Wouldn't you want to know if you were holding on to materialism or things in your own life and you were in that same category as the rich young ruler? Well, the answer is that you are unwilling to leave everything to follow Christ and to finish his mission when he calls you. That's the answer. Finally, the ultimate missionary Jesus made the ultimate sacrifice. He died for you and, you and, and I that we might live. Isaiah goes on to write, he was wounded because of our rebellious deeds. He was crushed because of our sins. He endured punishment that made us well. Because of his wounds, we have been healed. The perfect human died on the cross for the perfect cause, the salvation of our souls. Likewise, he left us with the task of spreading the gift of his sacrifice through picking up our own cross. He says, pick up your, your cross and follow me. He requires no more of us than what he was willing to do himself. He calls you and I to sacrifice everything in order to make disciples as the primary task and mission he has left for the church and the disciples to go into all the world. When we hear, uh, hear this, we have to understand that all authority in heaven and earth has been given to the Lord Jesus Christ. And this means that he has all authority over us and over the disciples, over each Christian, each individual, over the nations, over political leaders, over angels, and even Satan. Who are we not to obey the one who has all authority in heaven and earth? There was one man who took Christ's missionary example seriously, the Apostle Paul. He was born in the Jewish tribe of Benjamin, named after the most famous member of the tribe, King Saul, 
Paul was born in the holy city of Jerusalem and was trained by the rabbi Gamaliel, a member of the Jewish Sanhedrin. He was a leading Jewish teacher of his day. Paul excelled as a Jewish student. He himself explains in Galatians 1.14, he says, quote I, quote, I advanced in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries among my people because I was extremely zealous for the traditions of my ancestors. In fact, he was so zealous for Judaism that he was one of the most vicious persecutors of the church, uh, believing Christians to be Jewish heretics. He stood in approval in the stoning of Stephen, uh, the first Christian martyr, and his reputation amongst the first believers was a man who was greatly to be feared. But many of us know the story well. Paul radically changed when he saw his vision on the road to Damascus. Jesus revealed himself to him, saying, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And from that moment on, he was forever changed. In our ministry, we call this conversion process the Saul to Paul paradigm for world missions, where a radical non-follower of Jesus is transformed and recruited for God's mission, a calling that every single Christian on the earth is called to particip participate in to make disciples throughout the world. In fact, Paul willingly suffered imprisonment and beatings for preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. In fact, he would later make this very bold and audacious claim that all, all who wanted to live godly lives in Christ would suffer. Several of the books of the New Testament, including Philippians, were letters Paul wrote while he was in prison. Paul's statement in Acts 20, 24 reveals this dramatic shift in his allegiance. He says, but I do not consider my life worth anything to myself so that I may finish the task and the ministry that I received from the Lord Jesus Christ to testify to the good news of God's grace. Does that describe your life? If you said yes, then you know what your role is in the Great Commission. That our lives mean nothing to us that except that we may do what God has called us to, to spread the gospel, to make disciples, to extend his kingly reign throughout the world. Does that describe your life? Because that was Paul's mission. It was Christ's mission for us. I find it interesting that though Paul was a Jewish religious leader, dup uh, deeply rooted in Judaism, uh, God called him out to a completely different people, the Macedonians, the Greek philosophers, and the Stoics. Paul was trained under Gamaliel. He was a Pharisee of Pharisees, a teacher and interpreter of Jewish law. And I, I've often thought that we would have been so well, he would have been so well equipped to reach out to his fellow Jews. And yet God intended he called them out to reach the Gentiles. In Acts 17, we find Paul standing in the Areopagus, surrounded by Greeks, and he's reasoning with them based on their own foreign writings. He fully engages them in the gospel, uh, uh, reaching out to them and evangelizing them because they are who God had called them to. He was zealous in ministering to them, not because they were his people or because they were his tribe or they were from the city he was born in, but because God loved them. Now, for some of us reaching Muslims, it may be as counterintuitive as Paul being sent to the Greeks and Macedonians by God. Yet, if Paul were not sent to the Gentiles, many of us would not be Christians today. Because at that time, those Gentiles in the first century were the largest unreached people group in the whole world without the gospel. And it is through the cross-cultural efforts and church planning efforts of the early Christians, such as Paul who suffered for that, that you and I, that we received the gospel. Another man was born in Palma, Spain in 1,200 years after Paul, he also left a lasting legacy. 
This man's name was Raymond Law, and he was an intellectual and a scholar. He was appointed as an officer in the courts of King James II of Aragon, and Law was also the most popular poet in Spain. With privilege came uh, temptations, and in his early manhood, he was a man that was described as one who was utterly steeped in immorality. One night that drastically changed uh, when Paul told King Agrippa the story of his life, the, king of his te- uh, the, the key of his testimony were the words, quote, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. The Christians of the 13th century also believed in visions. This was the age of uh, St. Francis of Assisi and, and Catherine the Saint. One night, Lull was sitting on a, on a couch composing one of his depraved, perverted songs, when suddenly he, was, he saw on his right hand a vision of Jesus hanging on the cross. Blood was trickling from his hands, from his feet, and from his forehead. In the vision, Christ looked at Lull reproachfully. Immediately, Lull felt convicted of his sin. This vision appeared again eight days later, and again the dying eyes of the Savior were fixed on him. After a third vision, Lull, looking into the eyes of Christ, he was converted and decided to serve Christ faithfully. One day, as as Lull returned home, his biographers report that Christ once again appeared to him and said, Raymond, follow me. At that, he gave up his court position. He sold all his property, which was considerable, and he gave the money to the poor. He reserved only a small allowance for his wife and for his children. This man had a real conversion experience. He simply obeyed Christ's radical missionary recruitment. He spent nine uh, years in retirement, and in his 60s, came to the conclusion to preach the gospel to the Muslim world. Lull became the first recorded missionary to Muslims. Listen to the vow that he made with God. This is in his own words. To thee, Lord, to thee, Lord God, I, do I now offer myself and my wife and my children and all that I possess. And since I approach thee humbly, with this gift and sacrifice, may it please thee to condescend, to accept all that I give up and offer now to thee, that I and my wife and my children might be thy humble slaves. To Lull, this was not a commitment he was making on his own. It was a family covenant. How many of us here are willing to make that same vow today. Lord, I offer myself, I offer my dreams, I offer my wife, my children, my home, everything, Lord, for you. Missions was not easy for Lowell. He spent nine years training in the Arabic language. He then traveled to northern Africa up into Algeria, and the Muslims he came into contact with there were very aggressive. However, they did not follow the religious crusaders who sought sought to convert by the sword. The famous 20th century missionary uh, to Muslims, Dr. Sam Lozamer, writes that Lowell planned to attack with the new weapons of love and learning instead of the crusaders' weapons of fanaticism and the sword. The Christian world did not love the Muslims in the 13th century, nor did they understand their religion, end quote. It's amazing to me how little has changed in seven centuries. In the post-21st century, the world is also locked in war and conflict. And many of us in the global church don't really understand the Islamic religion. Nonetheless, we're called to love the Muslims, but do we love the Muslims? Are we anything different than the Christian world in the 13th century? Raymond Lull was very bold in his love and faith, uh, facing great persecution as a result. In in Algeria, Lull made this statement, death has no terrors, whatever, 
for a sincere servant of Christ who is laboring to bring souls to a knowledge of the truth. At one time, he was sentenced to six months in a North African dungeon and had been expelled from one city for preaching the gospel, much like Paul, the Apostle Paul. Remember, these events are all taking place in his 60s, and now he's in his 70s. And Lull is a shining example that it's never too late to be involved in the Great Commission. In his last missionary journey, Lull was 79 years old. His friends wanted him to retire and to die in comfort, but Lull would have none of that. On August 14, 1314, he once again crossed over to Algeria from Spain, and for nearly a whole year, he secretly discipled a group of Muslims he had led to Christ. At the end of his journey, Raymond Lull stepped out. He's into the open marketplace of the town he'd once been driven out of. He identified himself to the Muslims there and then began to preach openly and boldly in the public square. He pleaded with them with love, pleading with them. He spoke plainly the truth of the gospel. The people became filled with fanatic fury at his boldness and unable to respond to his arguments. They seized him and they dragged him out of town and in Algeria by the command of the king. He was stoned to death in June 30th, 1315. What a way to go. To be received by God in the midst of doing his will, it's the best way to go. And it was not until another 500 years later that this next missionary to Muslims was sent out, and his name was Henry Martin. Henry Martin was a missionary to to Muslims. He uh, he was uh, a, a young man who, who wanted to get married, but the woman uh, that he wanted to marry didn't want to go with him to the mission field, and so he had to go himself, so he never actually married. And he is known for translating the Bible into Urdu, into Arabic, and into Farsi. And uh, when you go to the Iranian church today, which has hundreds of thousands of believers that have become Christians in the country of Iran today, Many of you ask them, you say, who is the founder of the church in Iran? And many of them will say, Henry Martin. So he translated the New Testament and parts of it into these different languages to reach out to Muslims. And he did that all and died at the age of 30 years old. So let's take a look at what we've learned. If you're 50 or 60, or 70, or 80 years old, it's never too late to be involved in the Great Commission. However, if you're 15, or 16, or 17, or 20, or 25, or 26, or 27, or 28, 29, 30, you may not live to be past the age of 30. And right now is a time to invest your life so that when we get there, we receive the rewards of God that he wants to give us for being faithful on the earth. What are the common denominators between Jesus, Paul, Raymond Lull, and Henry Martin? First, they were all gripped by God's heart for the lost. Second, they all sacrificed glories, riches, and freedoms to reach out to lost people in another culture. And third, they all suffered for what they did. If the author of our faith, Christ, And the author of much of the New Testament, Paul, felt the primacy of the Great Commission, shouldn't we? In the church, we tend to separate out missions as a subcategory of ministries within the church. And I believe the foundation of all ministry in the church is the worship of God and the mission of God to the ends of the earth. The Great Commission is not a play where there are a few actors called missionaries and the rest of us get to sit back in the audience and watch. The Great Commission, if it is to be fulfilled, if it's to be completed, requires the participation of every Christian's involvement. Even God himself became involved, so why not you? If Christ had not gone into the mission field called all the world, we would have no salvation for the church today. 
if Paul had not gone to the Gentiles, most of us, you and I, we would not be Christians today. And if Raymond Lull had not obeyed Christ's call to the Muslim world, we would have had to wait 1,100 years for the first missionary to share the gospel with the Muslims. Christ did his Father's will. Paul did Christ's will. And now the question remains, like Raymond Lull and Henry Martin, will you too do the will of God for your life? Either your life will count for something and you'll enter uh, with the Father singing over you, well done, my good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of the Lord. Or you will have missed out on the greatest opportunity of your life. There are 1.57 billion Muslims today in the world. Just 20 years ago, there was only 800 million. It's doubled in just 20 years. We need a billion Christians to befriend them and share Christ's love with them and to reach out to them and to train to be able to reach them. We each want to leave a legacy. The eyes of the Lord look to and, to and fro across the earth for those he can strongly support who are faithful. Can he call on you? Can he call on me? Can he call on us? the global church in the north and the south, the east and the west, to prepare ourselves to finish the great commission in our lives. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your mission in this world. We ask, Holy Spirit, you would strengthen and, and, and empower us for the, the work you have for us to do. We ask that each one of us would know our role in the finishing and completion of the great commission. What is my role? What is our roles in the completion of the Great Commission on the earth. We ask, Holy Spirit, you lead, you guide us, that you speak to us, and we pray this all in the name of Jesus. Amen.